today we are going to speak about the our. Uh, we don't have yet a SPAC in Quebec. Our goal with this uh, panel and maybe with this event is maybe to raise the interest to have at least one SPAC in Quebec. So to start with, Mr. Stephen, what is a SPAC and what are its <coughs> benefits? All right, well, firstly, let me say how glad I am to be here and, and grateful to you after, uh, I think it's two years now, trying to, um, uh, together between Goodman's and, and, uh, and BCF, trying to, to find a, a SPAC in Quebec. It yeah. seems an ideal uh, vehicle um, to do what you're trying to do with this conference, increase the, the uh, public market participation of Quebec companies. Um, and I noticed... Uh, on the um, uh, commercial we just saw in the video, yeah. uh, there were you were there doing backflips, <laughs> uh, and and I thought to myself, yeah, you know, this we've yeah. we worked so closely Tr try trying to have a spec in Quebec. Yes, yeah, so we were close, <laughs> but we've worked so for many many years so closely um, between Goodman's and, and 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 BCF, and it's a real delight to be here in your offices today. Um, but you definitely BCF is known. Uh, to always do backflips for its clients, including uh, uh, ourselves uh, in Toronto. Um, a SPAC, I think, the best way to put it is, is uh, it's a way of taking public a company that you don't yet own um, and potentially realizing a significant uh, profit uh, without making a significant investment. Um, what is, what is the spec? What is the vehicle? So um, you set up a company before you have any idea necessarily of what you're going to buy with that company. And then you go to the public. You list that company on the, uh, on the exchange, on one of the exchanges. And you go and you raise a blind pool of capital. Under the, the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange, um, rules for SPACs, the minimum size SPAC is $30 million raised for the, from the public. But of course, we've had a number of SPACs who've raised significantly more than that, up to in Canada, uh, over uh, $500 million. And the sponsors, the people who found, who put that SPAC together, uh, automatically get a 20% carried interest in the IPO vehicle. In other words, if you raise um, $80 million from the public, you get $20 million out of 100 at the time of the qualifying acquisition in free shares. Of course, the founders have to take the risk of the initial setup capital for the costs of actually bringing that to market and then finding the target company. So the benefits to the sponsors are clear. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great source of capital. Um, if you've got a, a group of sponsors who have uh, a track record, and it's a potentially very profitable um, uh, activity if uh, it's ultimately successful. Not all are successful. Some have done well, some have done badly. I think you know, Craig will speak more to the experience. Um, in the US, there's been a very deep experience over several decades. But SPACs really only came to Canada in 2015. Um, so that's the benefits to the sponsors. You asked me about what are the benefits. Let me just, before, uh, uh, before shutting up, I will. I'll, uh, I'll just mention what, you know, what are the benefits to the other two key players in this uh, enterprise. So what are the benefits to the public market investors? Well, you get an opportunity to participate essentially in a private equity-like vehicle that you wouldn't otherwise be able to participate in. To put your money with a group who can take that uh, capital and deploy it in a way to create value. And then you go along for the ride. That's if um, things go well. If things don't go well, you're protected because your money goes into escrow until that qualifying acquisition happens. And essentially, you get a free option because you have the option to get the money back 
if you don't like that acquisition. So there is an automatic, and this is fundamental to the SPAC structure, there's a redemption right that after you find out what is the acquisition That's for acquisitions, the public, eh? exactly, for the public, not for the, for the public. Yeah, not the sponsors. An, exactly, for <laughs> the stuck. public. <laughs> the sponsors are invested, and that's right, their capital that they put in, uh, which is usually on a rough scale $1 of sponsor capital for $25 of, of public capital. And then that, that basic investment uh, becomes the basis to get that promote that I spoke about before. But for the public investor, you have the opportunity to get your money back if you don't like the acquisition. And on top of that, most SPACs have historically had a warrant attached, a warrant or a half warrant, which is really an option to get additional juice if the stock price goes above a certain level. So most SPACs have been issued at $10. The warrant exercise price has been typically $11.50. So if the stock appreciates by 15%, it's in the money, and you have that. And, and in some specs, we'll talk a little bit more about structure later, but in, 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 in some cases, typically, the conventional uh, spec structure has been that the warrant separates, so it starts to trade. And some investors, particularly hedge fund type investors, take uh, the option of, of getting their money back if, if the price hasn't appreciated significantly at the time of the acquisition, but hold on to the warrant. So it's kind of th heads they win, and tails they don't lose. So that's for the public. The third group um, in, this, uh, in this drama is the, are the targets, the, the target companies that the SPAC goes out to buy. And what's the benefit for them? Nobody's singing at the end. No? <laughs> Everybody's singing if it works out well. But the, the target uh, would otherwise be going public themselves. So why do they? go and, and sell themselves to a SPAC and give this 20% promote, which is effectively dilutive to them, um, if, they, if, they're going to, uh, if they could otherwise go public. Well, the answer to that, and Craig may have other uh, thoughts on this, but I think the key ones, the, the, the one obvious answer to that is, well, these are companies that otherwise wouldn't have a, have a simple path to going public. They might be too small to go public. We heard on the previous panel all the challenges of early sta earlier stage companies in the, in the venture um, world. And we've seen some specs that aggregate a group together, bring a few companies together, and those companies individually couldn't otherwise have gone public. But together, they make a great company. So you know, one and one makes three, potentially. So that's one, one advantage. Of course, if you associate with a group of, of deal makers and, and, and institutions with institutional support, there's some big institutions that have supported the SPACs uh, as co-sponsors, um, then you as a target have the benefit of, of riding their coattails and potentially having access to this growth capital. And you don't have to go through the um, headache of the initial public, the normal initial public offering process. We'll talk a little bit more about process later, but you still file a prospectus, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Craig, what are the benefits to your view? Uh, I, I think Stephen covered it well. It, it, it's really, it, it's that risk reward trade off out of the gate with respect to the constituencies that are involved and then also finding the fit with the qualifying transaction. We talked a little bit about the return profile for sponsors. But you also have to keep in mind, as Stephen alluded to it, that they have 100% of the exposure to the downside. There, you want to, there is, you know, you want to think carefully if you're a sponsor and you want to put a vehicle like this together. You want to think carefully about both ends of the spectrum because we have had some scenarios in Canada where SPACs have come to market to raise capital, tried to do qualifying transactions within the 24 to 36 month period. You typically allow them to have to approach um, target companies and make acquisitions. And, and if they don't meet those thresholds or that timeline, then there's multi-million dollar losses that can occur. So, so just want to balance everyone's thinking with respect to the upside and the downside. Um, and then really how we think about putting together the, the opportunity set as they approach the underlying businesses and the acquisition of them in the public market context. It's, you know, and I, I look at it through a lens of a public market investor <laughs> being someone who spends more time in equity capital markets. You really need to have a, a business profile from underlying performance standpoint uh, that suits the wants and needs of the investing public, both institutions and retail investors. So it's, it's important to think about that um, as you look at the benefits of this sort of transaction, as you consider it as an alternative. 
Good, good. Uh, what are the trends now in uh, Canada and US with the SPACs? Um, so I, I remember, uh, so 2015, there have been a few, then there have been <laughs> like a slow period. Then is it back? Yeah, I'll maybe, I'll maybe and, and Stephen jump in here too, I'll maybe start with, with the US market. Not unlike a lot of financial innovations we have in our, in our country, um, the SPAC structure came from the US market. Uh, you know, it was, it was something that was around and available in the late 90s. There were some active periods in the early 2000s where there was a lot of SPAC issuance in the U.S. market. Uh, it's ebbed and flowed with, with sentiment and, and overall uh, tone in the U.S. equity market. There was a period in time in the early 2000s when there was significant access to growth capital for small cap entities in the U.S. market, so the SPAC became less interesting to investors during that period of time. Uh, if you fast forward through a number of structural innovations in the U.S. market as they work to get the structure right for all investors involved in the process, uh, we had a period of time, call it 2015 to 2017, where we had record SPAC issuance uh, in the U.S. market. Uh, at times, the, the amount of capital raised in the SPAC structure was equal or greater than the amount of IPO capital raised in the U.S. market for all other issuing entities. Oh, yeah. So that, it's certainly not the case now necessarily, but it gives you a sense for how uh, compelling the SPAC market was in, in that period from 2015 to 2017. Uh, and then if you look at some of the transactions in that market over the last couple of years, the, the SPAC IPO itself, so not necessarily the pro forma market cap or enterprise value post-qualifying transaction, just the blind pool capital, we've seen um, entities raise north of a billion dollars in that market. So it went from something that was relatively small and niche years and years ago to something now where you can raise very large amounts of money. Uh, and then, and we'll talk a little bit more about it once we get to the structuring, but imagine how big the assets are that you have to be pursuing when you've already raised a billion dollars in a a blind pool vehicle. So that, that gives you a sense of maybe from a very high level how the, the, that market has evolved in the US over uh, several decades. In Canada, uh, as Stephen alluded to earlier, it's been, it, you know, it's been a shorter experience here. Um, we had, I'd say, four or five vehicles raise capital uh, initially in our market uh, in SPAC IPO transactions, typically in size from, call it 100 to maybe 250, 300 million. Uh, and then we had raised north of a billion dollars, let's say, in several vehicles there. And then from a market standpoint, investors wanted to see a number of those transactions actually go out and pur uh, purchase assets or underlying operating businesses and then show performance in the market post uh, those qualifying transactions. So a few of those, uh, a few of those transactions happened. Uh, I, I, I noted previously a couple didn't successfully close acquisitions and had to give <laughs> capital back to investors. So that all, that all generated out over a, a period of time, and then we saw kind of what I would refer to as the second generation of SPACs come to market in Canada post those, those qualifying transactions and series of outcomes, and we'll, we'll maybe spend a little, bit of, a little bit more time later on in the discussion about some of the structural changes that have happened through what I consider the, to be the first generation of SPACs and, and where we are now. Okay. How do you create a SPAC, and how do you do something called the SPAC? <laughs> Sure. So the first step is to um, put together a sponsor group. And as mentioned before, ideally the sponsor group has got access to some capital to fund the, the, the costs and, you know, and also to de-risk this acquisition process that, uh, that Craig was talking about. So, so in some specs, um, you, know, you have a group of individuals who've had a history in a certain sector they might want to focus on that sector. By the way, there are two kinds of SPACs in, in, in general. One is, is, is a generalist SPAC that just says, we're going to go out and um, make acquisitions or an acquisition. Uh, give us a blank check. Um, the other type of SPAC is, is a specialty SPAC, which is we're going to do this in the media sector or we're going to do this in technology. We're going to do this in healthcare or in real estate or whatever sector it is. Um, so you have that group of individuals and then sometimes they team up with an institutional partner or partners who say, look, we will, for a share of the promote, we will provide you with backstop capital to make sure that the, the situation that Craig mentioned before of, of the SPAC having to wind up at the end because it, it uh, didn't get to the finish line doesn't happen. Um, so that's step one. 
Uh, and <coughs> really, within a few weeks, you can do an IPO of that SPAC because you're not uh, bringing a prospectus with a business and financial statements. You're basically bringing a prospectus with a uh, blank financial statement. Uh, you know, just just initial capitalization. I like a CPC. Uh, in in that sense, it's very uh, similar. A startup. Very similar. And you go out and you you file your prospectus. You you raise your um, your initial capital and you put it into escrow. So that's stage one. Stage two is then to go out and look for your target or targets. And as mentioned, you could be one company. Or it could be we've got a, a one, one spec that we're involved with that actually bought six companies at the same time. There's another one that's actually just filed a final prospectus today uh, that's in similar structure, also six companies. That one's in the cannabis area. Um, but the, one, the other one is in the media sector. And, and so you have to put those acquisitions together. That might take uh, a couple of months. It might take many months. And of course, um, if you fail in the first attempt, you might have to go back and do, there have been cases where companies have failed in their first acquisition and then succeeded after that. At the same time, you'll put together a prospectus about that business or those businesses. It's not a prospectus to raise capital, typically. It's a prospectus to describe the business, what we call a non-offering prospectus. But that goes through the Securities Commission with the financial statements, just like you discussed on the last panel. Um, and you put all that together. You send, you publish that prospectus. And then, as I mentioned before, the investors have a redemption right. So based on that prospectus, that information, they can decide they're going to get their money back or they're going to stay in. And that then leads to the third stage, which is closing the acquisition or acquisitions, and then the company has de -spacked. It's a fully uh, regular public company trading on the stock exchange. That's, that's the basic process. OK. Do um, you have comments on that? Or? Uh, no, I think Stephen covered it. Well, I, I would say the, um, and maybe we'll talk about it a little later again, but the getting the initial capital, it, it, it's hard and it's labor intensive, but it, I tend to look at it as almost easier than pursuing the qualifying transaction. And, and really, as, it, as you walk through the nuances, we talked a little bit about the choices that investors have. So when you, when you get to the point where um, you get to vote, you also have, as an investor, have the opportunity to redeem. And, and that creates a little bit of a conundrum from a process perspective because every dollar that gets redeemed out is potentially a dollar lost in terms of covering the acquisition costs as it relates to buying the company that you're, you're targeting as part of your qualifying transaction. So we have to be, we just have to be conscious about that balance and, and on our side as we look at the markets, we're always trying to structure and tailor the process to de-risk that portion of it uh, mm -hmm. because it tends to be quite nuanced. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Uh, what are the characteristics of a successful SPAC? So, um, you want to start with that one? Uh, sure, I mean, sure. I, and, and I think we talked a little bit about the constituencies that are involved here in this process, and, and sponsors uh, is, you know, they are an important part of, of the whole process, and Stephen talked uh, a little bit about it earlier. It's, you know, it's really a management team and a group that has sector expertise or domain knowledge that people will look at and, and be willing to give them money for a period of time to trust that they will find something that will be successful and will make investors money. So you need, you need <coughs> depth of knowledge, domain expertise, as I highlighted, and a sponsor group that is going to be able to attract that initial capital. Um, you, you also need public market investors, both investors in the blank check or blind pool company initially, so you'll have fundamental investors, institutional investors, retail investors, and also some hedge funds that will be helpful in raising the capital there. Uh, and then also your investors that will help provide incremental capital typically. Almost, almost all SPACs, I think, typically need some incremental equity capital. And I say almost because we've got some great examples of those that didn't, both in our market and the U.S. But typically you need to find incremental investors as part of the qualifying transaction. And, and at that point in time, because you have a business that you can talk about, whether it be in technology or cannabis or, or manufacturing, uh, then you end up 
getting into a, a sector vertical where you'll have analysts and, and investors and portfolio managers that will have a view on the prospects of that business. So at that point, you tend to get um, long-only fundamental type investors that are really interested in understanding the value proposition at that point in time. So investors are very important through multiple steps throughout this process. Uh, and then also the, the, the targets themselves. So in the nature, value proposition, and underlying uh, characteristics of the business you're buying are, you know, are probably in the scheme of things as you look to turn uh, what's essentially a financial structure into a real operating business as an opportunity for public market investors is, is one of, if not the most important part of the process. Correct. Uh, in what sectors do you see there is a possibility of a SPAC in Canada in this year? Or, uh, is there a sector in particular? We talked about the media, yeah. cannabis. I, but, uh, I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're open across all sectors. I'm a, you know, I'm a public market guy, so uh, you know, we'll spend some of our time on SPAC, but also on follow-on offerings and IPOs. So I, right now, I would tend to answer that question through the lens of what's interesting in the market now. And you know, there's been a number of discussions around Lightspeed, which is a deal we're leading in the market that will start marketing on Monday next week. Technology, industrials, healthcare are all very interesting right now. Unfortunately for guys that sit in my chair, resources in the Canadian market are a little bit out of favor, and it's a big part of our market. So that's, you know, that slows down overall yeah. flows, but I, I would say you know, those three sectors, financial, healthcare, and, and industrials are, are very interesting to investors now. Okay, thank you. Stephen, do you have a comments on the... Well, let me, let me just say a couple of uh, additions to, to, to Craig's point, and going back to his, his comments about the U.S. trends and, and, and where we um, a little bit on Canada. You know, we, we've always tried to do things in the capital markets in Canada a little bit differently. And... Um, you know, it came, we came back, you mentioned earlier about REITs and there's income trusts, and we had, we, 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 we had some financial products that were, were, um, were used in the U.S., but somehow Canada brought the, the, the Canadian solution. With, with SPACs, I think a very important part of this is <coughs> who, who's your initial investor group in, from the public market? What's, what's your IPO book? And, and, and as you mentioned, you've got, you've got your, your hedge funds, your, your, your fundamentals, and retail, and in the U.S., um, you, you, you tell me if I'm wrong, Craig, but the U.S. has really been a hedge fund product. This, this, this SPAC uh, adventure and these, these billion-dollar SPACs you've spoken about have been, have been driven by, by, by the hedge funds. Um, in, in Canada, I think what we've tried to do, and I think what we should be trying to do, is balance that a bit more with the fundamental investors and with the retail to have a more stable SPAC structure. Yeah. Because the extent to which you don't have people pulling the rug, and the, you know, the hedge funds have a, obviously are looking for short-term returns, and we have a ten, will have a tendency to, to, to pull out earlier than whether it's at the time of the qualifying acquisition um, or afterwards. Um, and that creates a kind of unstable environment. So um, we talk about you know, what's, what's a, what's a what one thing that make a great SPAC is to have public investors who are in for the longer term, because that then gives the management uh, the runway to build the public company to, to, to um, execute on their, on their business plan and ultimately to have a stable vehicle, not just at the time of the acquisition, but, but going forward. Yeah. Okay. What are the risks? for the different parties. Yes, yeah, so... And is there a way to minimize the yeah, risk? Yeah, yeah. So we've started to, to, to cover that already. You know, the risk for the... For the so obviously, mm -hmm. is that you don't get your acquisition done. Um, I think it's... it's also, the, the costs. Eh? And, 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 then the, and then the yeah, costs the are sunk. The costs, and if, uh, if you don't get your acquisition done, the costs that you've put into it are sunk. Uh, fortunately, those cases that you mentioned, um, uh, I haven't been involved with. Uh, but I know that they had their own particular uh, issues. That, you know, that, that really shouldn't happen because at the end of the day, the, the, the team, if it's got a, a vision of what it wants to do, even if not, it hasn't got its idea on a specific target, um, it should be able to execute on it you know, with, the, with the right structuring. And the structuring, um, there are a number of innovations that uh, we've already seen in Canada that haven't been used in the US. Uh, or some that have been adapted from the U.S. to de-risk that de-spec. Uh, 
that, that, that qualifying acquisition process. So that's, that's the key thing to, to de-risk. So one of those... It's relatively it's, new, right? Eh? Uh, uh, this this de-risking, yes, yeah, yeah. relatively new, and of course the, the Canadian stock market is new. Yeah. 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 So so one of those would be to line up the capital at the beginning, as mentioned before, to have an institutional partner who says we will back you and we will fill in the gaps. If 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 people pull the money out, we'll backstop that. Uh, it's it's structured as as what we call a forward purchase agreement. Um, you can do it a little bit differently. You can do it as a kind of cornerstone investment at the front end that the, the, spot, that the uh, partner puts in. Uh, or this forward purchase agreement allows you to, to, to get that capital as a backstop later on. Or you can go out to the market. A number of the SPACs have gone out in the private market at the time of the qualifying acquisition and sort of filled in, backfilled the gaps with an additional private placement. So that's sort of one set of of ways of de-risking the, uh, the qualifying acquisition. A another modification that's been used recently, um, which works in the context of a retail-driven SPAC, is, is to actually um, link the uh, shares and the warrants together. And that de-incentivizes those who would pull their money out and hold on to the warrant, because they can't. If they pull their money out, they lose the warrant. If they stay in, at the time of the qualifying acquisition, then they have the, the, the warrant as well and, and, um, and, and, and can realize on that upside. So that's a structural innovation that has not been, to my knowledge, used in the US. Um, it's been used uh, a couple of times now in, uh, in Canada. But it relies on, a, a, I think, a constituency where a lot of the investors are retail or institutions who are going along with a specific you know, fundamentals, going along with a specific investment thesis. Um, you know, a third, uh, a third way, and Craig can probably speak this more um, informatively than, than, than I can because you're involved in the, in the equity capital markets process, but that is to try and recycle the capital at the time of the qualifying acquisition, to take it out of the hands of people who might want to move out and put it in the hands of people who might want to stay. So I don't know if you've got anything. <clears throat> I, I smile because I, I think I still have scars on my back from yeah. being hard to recycle capital during some of these <laughs> transactions. Um, but it, it certainly, uh, so uh, just to start there, um, you know, uh, investors, as we've highlighted a couple times throughout the discussion, have the option to redeem or not. And if, if they opt to redeem, they can, they can send a notice of redemption to the trust company, which holds those shares. And then what we can do as an intermediary is take, essentially, uh, talk to that investor. And if they agree to take a price in the market, usually as good or better, uh, relative to the price they would receive as part of that redemption, then we can take those units that normally would have been redeemed. So normally you would see the capital removed from the pool available to make the acquisition and, and take that and recycle it into other investors' hands that agree to leave the capital in the instrument, allow that to be funded or to be used to, to fund the qualifying transaction. So that's um, a fascinating uh, experience in and of itself. You can imagine... Uh, 40, 50 investors are thinking about tendering for redemption or not, and you've got usually a smaller amount of investors that are really focused on the merits of the opportunity uh, and the value proposition, and you're, you know, you're talking to investors, bringing something out of, uh, of uh, an arrangement with the trust company, and then crossing it on the exchange into new investors, and it's, it becomes... Uh, quite interesting over a number of days just to facilitate all those sorts of transactions. So certainly that's one way uh, to keep capital in. Um, from an investor perspective, the single most important thing on the front end, so as part of the IPO that, that investors highlight to me as something that's almost, not necessarily a requirement, but almost in their eyes necessary nowadays is that committed capital, whether it be the equity forward or, or non-redeemable units. So imagine you do a a $100 million SPAC IPO and you've got 30 to 40 million of committed capital that can't be redeemed as part of the qualifying transaction, all of a sudden that makes the value proposition upfront to investors to participate in that IPO much more interesting because on a probability on a spectrum, when they look at the outcomes, the, they're going to look at that one and say, there's a real high probability here that something's going to happen because the capital will be there to fund it in the future, and as well from an investor perspective, uh, to the extent you do have the ability to separate the warrants from the shares, those warrants now have much more value because uh, 
your, the, the spectrum of outcomes is biased towards that warrant being in the money with much higher probability at some point in the future. So that's, that's um, the, one of the biggest things that investors highlight to me as well. And, and, the, and finally, the, the other merit that investors really focus on now is if it's possible, and it has to suit the circumstance, but having independent third parties provide capital um, on the qualifying transaction helps public market investors understand the merits. So let's, let's just pick a sector, right? So if you're, if you're doing a transaction in the technology space, and a, a number of the you know, sector-leading uh, folks that we had up here that do invest in that space, imagine a scenario where you're bringing an acquisition to the SPAC instrument, and you've got two or three name brand investors that are putting in new incremental capital alongside with public investors. That's yet another way to de-risk the outcome and give the market confidence that the transaction is, uh, will be a good outcome for everyone. Thank you, Craig. I see that the red light is uh, <laughs> flashing <laughs> and Deborah is standing. Stop. Uh, do we have just one minute for a conclusion? One minute for conclusion. Yeah. 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 Do you have any, maybe? Well, all, all I, <laughs> I can know say... that we cut you short. No, no, <laughs> this, you could have uh, this gone is a, for a great long time. Uh, opportunity because, you know, the, the SPAC is still a, um, a baby. It's, it's, it's new. It's something that can be developed. It can be developed in a specific way in Canada and in a, speci a specific way in Quebec. And I think it, there's a big gap uh, here that you don't have one. Yeah, in Quebec. Uh, so, you know, let's yeah. do it. <laughs> it's exactly what we want Just, to do. And from my perspective, uh, and uh, Stephen and I had a couple calls leading into this, and I mentioned to Gilles previously that um, as a result of this conference, we've already, already had a number of discussions with good companies in the province that might make candidates to be qualifying transactions for a SPAC. So uh, thank you, Jill, and, uh, and okay. Stephen for being That's part of the excellent. panel. And you know, as a, an equity, uh, equity capital markets professional at National Bank, I'd like nothing better than to work with our partners up here and, and some entrepreneurs in the crowd to be helpful in bringing that first SPAC IPO to the market. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you, Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I will ask you to stay seated. We already have one question. I have one question Oops. for you. Although Oops. we did not we plan. Stephen Craig, the question. very quickly. <laughs> yes. Uh, fascinating. Thank you so much. We're going to try to sell this in Quebec and at BCF. We want to do this. I'm supposing that there's an advantage also for the target company in the process. Anything that we can use, simpler, faster, less reps, less this. Well, first, first, first of all, you know, you're, you're, it's, not, it's not guaranteed capital unless it's, it's de-risked, as we've discussed. But it's pretty much, you know, you've got the vast majority of the way there. Uh, instead of having to start off doing your IPO by, by yourself, it's if you're going into the public markets. You know, the, the, the alternative, of course, would be a private equity sale if you're a private, you know, you, if you want private equity. Um, but here there's an opportunity to get permanent capital. Uh, through the public market without all the strings that are tied to private equity and and uh, and so that's a big advantage and you know teaming up with the with the particular sponsor group uh, and creating a company